All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca podcast episode and a brand new guest. Um, yet again, it, it's kind of cool, actually, to think about the possibilities. We're about 500 episodes into the Boca podcast, and we keep getting to have new photographers on the show, and we'll be able to continue to do so. Today, Megan Baskin is here with me. Megan, do I understand right that you've actually been listening to the podcast for a little while? Yeah, I found your podcast a couple of years ago, actually, and I've been listening to it on and off. Well, I, I, first of all, I appreciate that. And I, when I get messages from, from listeners and I, I say, Hey, thanks so much for listening. It probably even sounds a bit cliche to them, you know, like, Oh, this, this guy's just feeding me a line, but I, I really, truly appreciate our listenership. Um, and I appreciate you listening in and then ultimately being willing to come on the show and have a conversation that I think is super important. We're going to actually talk today for those of you listening in, we're going to, we're going to be talking about how to create a site map for your website. And Megan and I were kind of joking around before we started recording about this sounds kind of like a nerdy topic, but at the end of the day, literally every single business owner, especially photography business owners, um, this, this is a more than relevant topic. In fact, highly important if you care to build your business. And so we're going to get into that topic here in just a little bit. But before we do, Uh, As we normally do here on the podcast, I want to start with a question about brand position, Megan. And first of all, give our listeners a little bit of context. What market are you based in? Well, here's the backstory. I am a Philadelphia-based wedding photographer. I've been shooting weddings for about five years, but I've always loved anything with visual storytelling. And um, this past year, I actually took the official plunge and created a web design and branding business for other photographers. Okay. Um, So... But the brand position, the unique value proposition is I use a combination of marketing and UX strategy and intentional design to create brands and websites for photographers and other creative entrepreneurs that help them book their ideal clients and take their business to the next level. Yeah, well, and, and you, you you said that, and that was a bit of a mouthful, but I'm looking at your, your website and the homepage uh, at baskinco.com, so B-A-S-K-I-N-C-O.com for those of you listening in. And I, I love that you simplified it even further there on the site. You said, elevate your business with strategy forward website design that connects with your ideal clients. So somebody lands on your homepage and they immediately know what value proposition you offer to them. Uh, which is really at the, you know, at the root of the significance of brand position, why we talk about it so much. There are so many people doing what we do, whether it's photography or in this case, brand strategy and website design. So if they come to visit our site, they need to know immediately how, first of all, what service we offer, uh, but then secondly, how we do so differently than the other person who's doing that thing. It's super, super important. I love that you've got that above the fold on your website too. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I think it's very important. There's so many people who do all these, you know, in the online world, you have so many people that are specialized in different niches and it's important to set yourself up and like, how are you different? What makes you different? And I think for me, it's my um, experience being in the wedding industry and then also um, just experience in business school and beyond loving graphic design and website design of taking classes that really focus on consumer and buyer behavior and marketing strategy and brand strategy and being able to use that knowledge and combine it with what I learned in the creative space to offer this service to other creatives. Well, and you also got lucky. I was noticing, I was just thinking about your your URL, baskinco.com. It's it's hard these days to find to come up with a domain name that is short enough, that's easy to share, easy to type in. Um, I guess you kind of got lucky with with this. It, it ends up being a brilliant ni- name just because it stands out. I've never heard of Baskin <laughs> Co. before, Baskin Company before, but it also worked out really well for your URL too. Thank you. Yes, I... <laughs> was back and forth on like, what do I call this business? I want it to be separate from the photography side, but I don't know what to call it. And I'm just like, we're just going to take our last name and run from there. Yeah. And this is after, this is just after the whole Carol Baskin phase had passed. So I was hoping there would still be a domain, but we're all good. You're Yeah, you totally covered the base. Okay, cool. Well, so brand position, we've talked about that. Let's transition to the next big question that I usually ask here. And that is to do with customer experience. As cliche a topic as this might seem, at the end of the day, you know, in fact, because of the very thing that we were just talking about, the fact that there are so many photographers out there, and and in your case, also so many other designers out there, uh, while we might be able to offer a service that is unique in one way or another, at the end of the day, those clients are going to talk about us and keep coming back if we offer a really great customer experience. So, 
based on your experience, whether as a photographer or designer, I'm curious what has been the most important principle behind providing a wonderful customer experience for your companies. So for both, it's do what you love and work with people that you love. Um, I think when you're passionate about something and you're doing something like this, it's so tangible and palpable for the people that you work with that you care about what you're doing. And it's it's inspiring to them, but it's also also like, hey, I love what I'm doing and I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this out of passion. And then as far as working with people that you love, this is like part of the reason why I got so interested in working with brand strategy for other photographers, because I feel like being able to work with ideal clients who you connect with and become friends and you guys just get each other on this next level and they really appreciate the work that you do and you really respect them as clients. I think that's just something magical. And I think it makes like every single day as cheesy as it sounds, it's it's literally living the dream when you're doing something that you love to do and the people who you're working with just become your friends. And it's just amazing. It is. And our, our photography industry really is such a great place. I'm a little biased. I, I told you before we started, I've been in it now for 20 years or so. And I just, I'd love it. Uh, you know, there, there have been instances and still I have kind of in my back pocket those potential future professions if you will thinking about getting to psychology and um, I've been involved in trading over the last nine months or so in the, in the market and that's another opportunity and option and and these are things that I could potentially also be involved in while still being in the photography industry but if I had to walk away from the photography industry at some point uh, whatever the reason I would certainly miss the people and the environment. I mean, you, the, I guess the culture ultimately of our industry. So you are super lucky that you get to work with other photographers. We've got a really cool industry. And by the way, for those of you listening in, we're, we're talking about uh, Megan's, both her design company as well as uh, her photography business. I should mention her photography website is Megan, M E G H A N, Baskin, B A S K I N dot com. And uh, we'll link to those in the show notes, both websites, as well as Instagram. Instagram is just Megan Baskin and then Baskin.co on Instagram for her design company. Let me keep going though, Megan. Um, Talk to me about time, time management. You've got two companies now. How are you balancing managing two companies with also having a personal life, maintaining relationships? So I definitely struggled with this sometimes, but overall I've noticed creating a routine really, really helps. So I have a quote unquote clocking in routine where I kind of just light a candle and I make my coffee and I just get myself in the mindset to work. I think that's one of the hardest parts about working from home is like you have to put on clothes and pretend like you're a real human and you're not (laughs) just going to work from bed. Yep. Um, Trying to stick to office hours. So I really try to keep the most of my work between nine to five. And then so that later on in the day, I can focus on, you know, going to the gym, hanging out with my roommates or my friends and cooking dinner and just like not serving myself. So I'm not pouring from an empty cup. And then also um, my routine for batch working. So each day of the week has a different priority. So Monday is a lot of admin days where I'll go in and I'll do my bookkeeping and then I'll pay taxes if it's that week and all that sort of stuff. And then I'll batch certain days for design. And then moving forward, I know we talked a little bit about how I do wedding photography and design. Um, seasonally, most of my design work is going to be in the off season. And then so when it comes to spring and fall, when it's the big shooting season for photographers, that's when I can scale back and I'll know not to book any projects then because one, photographers are going to be busy. They're probably not going to want to start a big web design project. And two, so that whatever um, season I'm in, I can be giving the most effort and attention to that client and those projects. Wow. You, you, you seem super organized. Is, is this something that just kind of comes naturally for you or have you learned over time how to do it? Honestly, I, <laughs> I've i gone that before where people are like, you seem like you have it together. And I think it's a facade because I don't feel like I do. <laughs> I know the routines that are going to work for me and yeah. I know what I should be sticking to, but it's actually so hard to truly stick to those. So I'm working on it. But when I was saying like, oh, nine to five office hours, I try not to set an alarm. And if I wake up at like 830, I'm probably not going to get into quote unquote the office by like 930 or 10 after I've had breakfast and done what I need to do. So it's a work in progress. I think it's always going to be a work in progress, but that's the fun of it, I guess. Well, you know, something that you said earlier that was interesting and I made note here, um, for those of you listening in, break the fourth wall a little bit. I usually have a notebook 
and a pen so I can take notes as I'm listening in and and kind of continue to, to engage in the conversation at hand. But I, I wrote down the word priority because you mentioned earlier that despite the fact that you have certain days chosen for particular activities, um, it, it doesn't sound like you're writing any other potential activities off. So each day is has a priority for admin work or for this task or that task, and yet there's still room for other things to kind of fit in there if need be. How do you how do you balance that though? Like, are, are you saying, all right, on my day dedicated to admin tasks, I do that for three or four hours, and then the rest is just kind of gravy. I can kind of do whatever. How do you do that? Yeah. So it. Everything changes week by week. I know you probably understand this too. Um, So I'll have these priorities for each day. And those are kind of like the routinely things that need to get done. So bookkeeping has to be done once a week for me. It's paying sales tax. It's going to be done once a month. But these things aren't super, super time consuming. And then you also have your everyday tasks like email. Um, These are things you know you're going to have to do. Everything else that gets filled in is working on working on projects or if I have to edit a session or onboarding a client or these things that take a lot of time. And then with this extra time, I can go in and work on like brainstorming and working on things that are going to move the needle forward or thinking about what I want to do um, with my marketing next quarter. So um, you're able to take like, okay, what needs to be done for sure that needs to be done on a schedule. And then you can fill in with, okay, okay, what needs to be done for my current projects and then filling in after that with what needs to be done. That's going to move the needle forward. That's not necessarily for a client or not necessarily to keep the business running, but to take it to the next level. Do you have a, do you use like a task or project management system that enables you to keep up with all that, you know, that that you can set due dates for repeating tasks for so that it's, it's just easy to follow? I have my Google Calendar and then for a while there I was using Google Calendars and Google Tasks but for now for some of like the short one-off tasks instead of setting it as like um you know report expenses as a task I'll just put it like 10 a.m. on Monday report expenses so that when I pull up my calendar I can see what I'm going to be doing at each point of the day. Wow, that's great. You know and I, I I like I'm all for simplicity and kind of minimizing the number of moving parts in our businesses. I think it when we talk about this idea of time management, one of the things that that causes photographers to spend really way too much time in their business, as, as weird as that might sound, is that they're they've got there's just too many moving parts, too many pieces of software, too many different um, ideas, maybe even that their their brand is representing. So they've got their hands in all these different places. It just complicates the daily existence as a photography business owner. The more that we can minimize the number of moving parts, including even something like task management or project management, um, the, the better. So instead of having an additional system for t- task and project management, the idea that you're just using your calendar, which you're naturally going to be in anyway, just to keep up with your what's going on in your life, uh, I, I really like that idea. Um, that's something that I might have to experiment with a little bit in the future. Yeah, definitely. It's all about what works for you. I've definitely tried my hand at different project managing softwares, but there's just so many and they all have so many different features and functions and it's almost overwhelming. And another thing, um, kind of going off of what you were talking about is the overwhelm of a lot of us have these huge dreams of these things that you want to do, you know, maybe we don't want to do a rebrand or plan this massive style shoot or launch this course. And we get all into this and we want to do it all at once, but it's so important to be realistic with what we can actually accomplish in a day, in a month, yeah. in a quarter. I have totally held myself back by trying to do so much at once that I couldn't do any of it. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I'm torn. This is an interesting topic because as much as our culture seems to be, I think it's died down a little bit, um, but it certainly was obsessed for a year or two there with this whole idea. And I think a lot of it was driven by Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, are you familiar with Gary? Yes. Okay. So this idea of hustle, um, you know, this this word gets thrown around quite a bit. And certainly I, I, I got a certain amount of inspiration from his message in that regard. What was it? A um, really, I think it was probably about four years ago or maybe maybe just three or four years ago. Anyway, w- as we were launching this podcast um, and it was still in its early stages, I, I realized the significance, not just of hustle, but of consistent consistency, showing up consistently. Um, and this is something I'm working on in my, my personal and professional life, both to continue to improve. But as I show up consistently, I, I feel like I, I always want to push myself. 
Um, and certainly that is applicable when it comes to the amount that I'm accomplishing in, in a day. And there are days when I'm not as, I'm not accomplishing all that I would like to, or I didn't follow my, my daily schedule as well as I would have liked to. And I get frustrated myself and, and down on myself. And I know at the end of the day, that's not helping me. Um, so maintaining some kind of a balance in that regard, I think it's super healthy and I'm, I'm glad that you bring that up. But I, let me jump to the next question because again, this has to do with time management, outsourcing, delegation. This is something we talk about quite a bit on the podcast, um, naturally because of course I own an editing company, but I own an editing company because I understand the significance of delegation. When I started Photographer's Edit back in the day, and by the way, shout out to photographersedit.com. For anybody who's not familiar with the brand, make sure you check it out if, if you need help with your editing. But I started the company because as a photographer myself, I was spending way too much time behind the computer doing busy work that didn't increase my bottom line, and I was missing out on time with my family. So I needed a solution. And this is not just applicable to editing. It's applicable to, to admin man, or admin tasks like you were talking about, Megan, and to album design and you know accounting and so forth. There's so many different pieces to the business that we could potentially delegate or outsource to someone else or to another company. Um, so all that to say, I'm curious that this is something that you've experimented with in your business. Have you seen any success with it? Yes. So outsourcing, I'm a control freak. I love doing things myself, but I realize you have to outsource. You can't do it all on your own. So um, Baskin Co. is fairly new. We did launch last fall. So our current priorities beyond serving are... Um, current clients projects is creating and executing a marketing strategy to find new ones as well as creating a content library because one of the really big goals I had in mind when I came up with this business was to serve other creatives with education and free resources and get them started so my team is one we have Caroline she is big into marketing and graphics so as far as marketing she is helping execute this plan that we created right now we are focusing on building our Pinterest and next up we're actually going to start playing around with Facebook ads and see if we can do anything with that um, I haven't done that yet so totally new but we'll see um, and then she also helps with what I want to call last mile content development. So if I have an idea for a blog post and a rough outline, maybe it's about improving your SEO, um, she, I'll write that down and she'll turn it into a, a digestible, readable blog post that's ready for the internet. Okay. Um, and then if I have a blog post that I wrote and I have this idea, but I don't have a graphic for that, she's there and she'll make a graphic and she'll get it optimized for Pinterest and she'll get it published that way. Um, and then there's Casey. Casey is a wedding photographer for herself and she's a college senior and she is interning this semester and she's kind of the jack of all trades. She's been helping a lot with um, copy outreach or anything else. Um, so those are those, the two main girls that I work with and they're both amazing and I love them and I definitely want to keep outsourcing. So this wedding season, I want to outsource my editing, album design, all of that good stuff. I know this really great company, by the way. <laughs> I know I, when you were saying that I was like I need to maybe I'll find one there because I the, the thought of outsourcing my editing is such like um it's a yes obvious this is so easy but I feel like the actual getting there of you know transferring the files yeah and just getting started with it seems so overwhelming but I feel like every single photographer should be outsourcing their editing I can go on a tangent about this. I can hold back if you would like, or I can go off. On no, it. I, I would actually, for the sake of a, a, a conversational experiment, if you will, I'm, I'm really curious to have this conversation with you um, for your sake, but also for our listeners' sake as well, because I think the thought process behind delegation is an interesting one. And and I want to be clear, and then I, I want to let you take this, this conversation away, but um, there is, despite the fact, again, that I have an editing company and that delegation is at that root of that editing company. We've been around for 13 years. I'm still learning what it means to effectively delegate because yeah, to your point, Megan, it's tough to give up control in many cases. And then when you're like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give up control of this particular thing and hand it over to this person or to this company. Then the process of doing so can feel tedious and kind of frustrating. And then you know, things don't get done maybe exactly like you had in mind in the first place. So then you got to figure out how to better communicate. So it does get done. There's, it, it can be a bit of a overwhelming is a bit of a dramatic word, but it, it can be a frustrating process at times for sure. Um, is, is that something, I mean, have you experimented, for example, with outsourcing editing in the past and, and you had frustration there or have you just kind of held back altogether? 
Well, let me talk about a little bit of barrier to outsourcing overall that I had was I had just finished up my freshman year in college and I was going into a very busy summer of shooting and I knew I couldn't handle it all myself and I couldn't get myself to hire anyone else because I felt like I was unqualified. I'm like, you know, like, oh, I'm like 19 years old. Like I shouldn't be having interns. I'm not worthy of this. And I had to get over this mental block. And I feel like that's something a lot of, um, newer businesses struggle with when they feel like they're not worthy of asking for help because it's not a big thing yet. And that's something I had to get over. And then the next mistake I made was hiring someone um, to be like, to just double me. And I was like, I just need another me. I just need to hire someone who will just do everything. And that's not, that's not good. Like most people, people have specialties. People can't just like duplicate you and do everything exactly as you would. But as far as outsourcing editing, the reason I put it off for a while and I was actually really against it because I thought that it was almost like cheating because I'm like, I can't not edit the photos that I take. Mm. But that is so false because I feel like, especially when you're getting into You know, obviously with outsourcing editing, you're editing a couple photos from each section. The whole wedding is still being delivered as your exact style with like whatever secret sauce you use with your editing. Um, But there was like this initial like refusal to give up that part. And I was totally wrong there. So I think that's what put me off for a while, too. Well, I'm curious, and I want to come back to that thought, because that's an interesting one. Um, But I'm curious, you, you talked about the initial apprehension of hiring, not feeling like it, you were old enough or experienced enough to be going and hiring somebody else from the get-go. Something else that I hear, I've heard quite regularly from photographers, is that they didn't feel like they could afford to outsource their their editing. Or the thought was, hey, you know what? I can hold on to this myself, hold on to a bit of cash, do it myself. I know I'm going to get it done right. Uh, and then I don't, have to, I don't have the expense. Did you have any apprehension about the expense of it? Um, yeah, I did. Because okay. I would take the cost of my wedding and then I would subtract the cost of outsourcing it. And then I would think, Hmm, you know, what if I just did it myself? Right. But then when you're actually in like the grunt of busy season, it's like, I would pay someone everything in my bank account to edit this. And just get it out. <laughs> yeah. So I think people can't afford to not outsource. Well, That's and, my take on it. And, and the, the, the thing about it's one thing to look at it just from a simple math standpoint and subtract the amount away from whatever your, your gross revenue is from a, from a wedding or from a portrait session. Um, but then the other piece that I think gets left out a lot of times is what you could be doing with the time that you saved that would actually make you money because sitting behind a computer doesn't make you money. And instead of being behind the computer, if somebody else is doing the editing for you, especially when it comes to weddings, you know, eight, 10, 12, 16, 20 hours to edit a wedding, completely what could you do with that time that would then actually drive new business um it is a question that i think every single photographer should ask now i realize that every photographer is going to outsource editing in the end maybe they'll choose to delegate other types of work Uh, but at the end of the day we have to think about the time component we also have to realize that our uh, our clients or potential clients 98 percent of them do not notice the the nuanced details that we are projecting onto their potential experience if you outsource editing. You know, oh, are they going to notice that that the the white balance was you know two points off, or that the that it was uh, they, there was a bit of magenta in this thing, or, or contrast wasn't just quite right? And they're going to be pissed off. These are all nuanced details that we're noticing as photographers. Um, and in conversation with other photographers that most of our clients don't even care about. And I've given this example before. I have these snapshots um, printed with a little Fuji Instax printer um, on my fridge at home of of me with friends, with family. And they're not perfect and color balanced and tack sharp and perfectly framed and posed and all this stuff. But they're some of my favorite photos. It's why I've got them there. And it has nothing to do with them being perfect from an editing standpoint. Um, so we have to keep that perspective in mind. Uh, for those of you listening in who are curious about this idea of delegation of, out, of, of editing, keep that in mind as perspective. What we are projecting on our clients is what their experience might be if we outsource our editing is in, in most cases just simply not the case. The other thing, um, and Megan, I'm glad you brought this up, you, you know, the idea of, quote, cheating if we're giving the work to somebody else to do. Think about the interaction, and this is not directed specifically at you, just for everybody listening in. Think about the the last, say, five or ten companies that you interacted with. How many of those companies involve more than one employee? 
And at the end of the day, we know that any, certainly any mainstream company that we engage with has multiple employees involved in the process. When they sold us a product, they didn't cheat because they employed 20 people to do so. We actually benefit from that reality. And so the idea that as photography business owners, we hire somebody else, whether it's to do editing or album design or handle admin tasks or do accounting or whatever it might be, it enables us to run a brand that can better serve our clients at the end of the day. And I think that perspective is super important. Well, I also think the other thing is like you were talking about white balance and contrast. And, you know, what if the editor doesn't do it as they planned? Well, I don't know if there are any other photographers out there who are listening to this and thinking like, I struggle with that. Personally, I can look at a photo and I will change the white balance for 15 minutes and it's not going to be consistent. <laughs> yeah. And that's another thing with outsourcing. Hire people that are better than you. And if you're outsourcing to an editor, they edit photos all day. They're really good at matching your style and they can probably keep it more consistent than you can. Well, I, I yeah, I, I would highly agree with you. And, and it's true. I mean, I, I've been guilty of this, certainly, of just sitting there playing with images and, and overanalyzing and overthinking it. Um, it is nice to be able to hand that to somebody else who can look at it more objectively um, and and hopefully even process it even more consistently than, than we would. And I don't want to minimize for those listening in who are saying, well, but are you justifying like subpar quality work to to uh, give to our client in the name of they're not going to notice no but i th- what we have to to do for the sake of those photographers who are apprehensive about giving up their editing is maintain a certain amount of perspective and we're projecting a level of perfection uh, on this potential experience that isn't necessary you can find an editor or an editing company that can do you know 90 to 95 percent of what you do as far as the style and the look and feel and your client is going to be stoked about it just as a finished product but they're going to be even happier because now you didn't take four to six weeks to edit a wedding and get that back to them. Now they got it back really, really quickly and it's beautiful. And meanwhile, you also had time to further build your company. So I I don't want to beat this into the ground, Megan. Um, I appreciate you kind of entertaining the conversation. I rarely talk about photographers at it. um, And I certainly don't want this podcast to become a big commercial, but it's super important because the podcast really centers around time management. I want personally, as a business owner, to have a life. I want you to have a life. I want our listeners to have a life as business owners. And the way that we're going to be able to do that is to be super intelligent about the systems that we implement in our business. Part of that is delegation. I think it's really important to talk about. And I, I really appreciate your your honesty and openness about it. Yeah. And one thing I'll say to cap off of this, because again, I could probably talk about you know anything for six hours. It's not great, but um, <laughs> just investing in delegation, investing in outsourcing. Um, if you have a money mindset of you're looking at your revenue and you're wanting to keep the most of it that you can, that's not necessarily the right mindset. I know when I kind of change my mindset from wanting to invest as much as possible back in, it comes back. So Mm. with um, like a website, for example, a website can be one of the biggest expenses if you're hiring someone to do custom design. And it's such a big cost up front. But when you're hiring someone who knows exactly how to do your brand and your website and your position and all of that stuff, it's going to be something that comes back. Like these things repay for themselves. So even if you're spending a couple hundred on outsourcing your editing or a couple thousand on a custom design or a couple hundred on a really bomb show it template, it's going to come back. And once you, once I changed my mindset to this idea that it comes back, that's when I started to see real tangible growth in my business. Yeah, for sure. Uh, man, and that's a loaded topic too, but I, for the sake of continuity <laughs> in our conversation, we'll come back to, it. I, I think it's, but I absolutely agree with you. Number one, and just maybe to, to sum up my, my thought as you're saying that, Uh, It's also important to, and it sounds like this is something you're already doing, Megan, but for our listeners, for everybody, myself included, it's a good reminder to to proactively manage our finances so that we are aware of where we can spend that money. You know, at the end of the day, if all we're thinking about is, oh no, I just need to hold on to this money as much as possible, but we're not aware of, of our income stream, number one, what our expenses are and where we actually have room to budget for investing in our business whether it's for the website or editing or for whatever it might be. Uh, if we're not aware of that because we're not proactively managing our finances, then, then we're just hurting ourselves in general. Awareness is, is an, gives us an incredible amount of empowerment. It helps minimize stress and we can actually proactively run our businesses for the sake of, of growth in the end. And I think that's really important. I, I want to talk to you about um, a, 
impactful book, whether it's a self-help book or a business book that you've read or listened to, what would you recommend to our listeners from your experience? Okay. So instantly my answer was The Defining Decade by Meg Jay. Okay. Um, it's not a business book. It's more of a self-help book and it's advice and anecdotes from a clinical psychologist experience working with 20 something. And the t- takeaway that I got from the book was like, what you're doing right now matters. And even if you're not in your twenties, I think it's still a really cool book to read. Um, a lot of the book was focusing on relationships and your development in your career, but overall it just changed my perspective and how I approach working in my business as well as my overall life. Um, because all these little things that I do every day are building to something a lot bigger and it's easy to get into a mindset of like, you know, it's just another Wednesday and little apartment and I'm not doing much, but every little thing builds up to something bigger. So that's also, it's really entertaining. I just, it was an easy read. I'm not a big reader, (laughs) but I went through this book in like two days. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I've I've got it pulled up here on Amazon, Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now. And I love that you bring this up because in fact, I think you're the first person to to bring up any book specific to a particular segment of of the photography industry, which um, by the way, is highly relevant. I mean, the, the number of young female photographers in our industry has, has grown quite significantly over the years. And um, so what a relevant book. Well, we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com for everybody listening in. Well, what I want to do now uh, before we, uh, what well, really not even before, I, I want to jump into our primary topic for today, which as I mentioned earlier in our conversation has to do with sitemap or put more generally navigation um, effective navigation on our website, uh, our photography website. For those of you listening in, maybe you have an existing website and you're trying to figure out amidst you know the, the crazy economy that we're in at the moment, how can I more effectively convert potential clients? This is going to be a highly relevant conversation to you. Maybe some of you who whose businesses are running okay at the moment, Uh, but you'd like to take things next level. Again, highly relevant. Every single one of us need to be thinking about how a user, a potential user of our website, what what their experience is and how they are able to navigate through the site, number one, but then secondly, how we are or are not uh, effectively converting them, calling them to action and converting them. And uh, so we're going to get into this in some detail today. Megan, I, I'm curious, maybe as we get started, what would you say, let, let, before we even talk about what a site map means, talk to me about how you would define the purpose of a photographer's website to begin with. All right. There are kind of a couple different parts to this, but at the very basic level, you want to show your work, show your experience, what it's like working with you, and give your clients a place to connect with you. Um, so I think every single photography website has that good but there's a lot more we can do with it. So it gives off your first impression. So the design you have, the design elements, the layout, the images you show, all these visual elements are subconsciously positioning your business in the website viewer's mind. So I guess you, like when you're working in your business, you have a full 360 view of the type of weddings that you shoot and the type of clients that you want to work with. But someone who's going to your website for the first time is first getting exposed to this. So the initial images that they see, the types of weddings that they're seeing, or the types of photography that they're seeing, um, is going to like initially make a first impression and position themselves. So if you're doing, if you're a wedding photographer and you have a header gallery and it's all photos of like sunset photos out in a field at like far rustic weddings, that's positioning your business in that. And then the design decisions will also dictate the perception of your business. So if you have a lot of bold and bright colors, the potential client's going to perceive your business in a somewhat or in a different way as someone who's using soft pastels and calligraphy fonts and a very fine art approach. And whether they know it or not, but it's going to subconsciously just like put an idea of what your business is and who it serves in mind. And this also gives, when done strategically, your ideal client an opportunity to resonate with the design and also pique their interest in like, hey, this might be the person for me. And then moving forward into what we're talking about today, a strategic website layout. So the user experience that your audience on your website has or a sitemap is going to give you an opportunity to sell yourself to the ideal clients who can benefit from your services. 
Okay, I want to go back to what you said earlier because it, it it's uh, I'm a huge fan of brevity and that's ironic because even today I realize as as we're having this conversation Megan I'm <laughs> I'm talking more than normal I think I miss I must have just had like a little too much caffeine or something but I I love brevity for the sake of impact and and time management for that matter. You said the purpose of a website, a photographer's website is threefold. Number 1 to show work, number 2 to show experience. And then number three, I wrote down invite to connect. I, that is a, that's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful summation. And I think, you know, I, I, when we get into really any topic here on, on the show, what our regular listeners might notice um, is that I like to start with philosophy uh, or a framework of big ideas before we get into the, you know, here's a list of five things to go do to improve your website today or whatever it might be, something, you know, kind of catchy like you would see in a blog post. Um, I, I love to get into kind of the, the framework of principles that drive why it is that we're then going to go do those things. And I think this right here is super powerful. Show your work. Your, your website is to show your work, show uh, the experience or share the experience the client's going to have with you, and then invite them to connect with you. Brilliantly summed up. And so in the context of those three big ideas, how would you then define a site map. Um, and, and maybe we can kind of tie this, create this, it's a two-part question really. Define site map, but then explain how that relates to the, the to the goal of those three things. Show the work, show the experience, and invite to connect. Site map. When you're talking about the design side, a site map is the blueprint of your website. It's the hierarchy of pages and the content that's going to go on these pages. So that's a site map. There's no fonts, there's no colors. It's just what's going on there, where it's going to be. Think of it like a little map and like webs and arrows and everything. Yeah. Like a, kind of like a, I guess, mind map, right? Yeah. Just okay. like that. Okay. Um, and then tying it to show your work, show your experience and give your place to clients to connect. That's pretty much in order. Um, so sitemap takes your clients on a journey or your potential clients on a journey and it's showing them your work showing them your experience and how you approach the work that you do, how you get to that final product that they're seeing in those images, and then giving your clients a place to connect. So these are the primary, secondary, and even tertiary actions that you want your different clients to take. Connecting could be filling out a contact form and submitting that inquiry to book you for a wedding or um, downloading an opt-in so they are now on the email list. Whatever connection point that is, that should be the end point. That should be the bottom of the site map. Okay, I, I want to stop you here because first of all, this is gold already. I'm I'm personally going to to write this out. I mean, I'm taking notes. I'm writing notes down. I usually take digital notes. I use Evernote extensively. I'm going to actually write this out as an outline for myself and and kind of go back and look at my my brands as it relates to again those three goals. But then I, I love the word hierarchy. I also, by the way, I love tertiary. I, I use that word occasionally. I don't think I've ever, <laughs> at least in recent time, heard anyone use that. I love that you use that word. Uh, but I, the idea of a hierarchy um, in the form of a mind map. So I can, for those of you listening and you're trying to figure out how to put all this together, I can imagine like, let's take three bubbles, for example. Um, and, and one would be show work and then another would be show experience and another would be invite to connect. And then from that, you're, you're drawing lines into these maybe smaller bubbles, which would represent, uh, you know, potentially, I, I'm also a huge fan of minimal number of pages on a website to make navigation easier. Maybe you can comment on that, Megan, but um, I don't know if there would be pages underneath each of those sections in the form of a hierarchy. What, what would that look like from your perspective? So for the sitemaps that I'm doing for myself and my clients, yeah. um, I use show it. So I'm not sure. I know it's pretty awesome thing for a lot of photographers. Yeah. So there are different canvases on each pages. So my site maps have, you know, we have home and then I'll have the different pages in a different colored post-it note. And then under that, I'll have a different post-it note for each canvas. So a canvas is like a section or a chunk of content okay. with a purpose. Yep. And then so I'll have a post note for each canvas and then um, a different colored post-it note for a call to action and then a little arrow guiding it to whatever that is. That could either be a different page, perhaps a blog post, perhaps a contact form, just a different call to action. So that's visually how I think of the hierarchy. So you're, you're a post-it notes girl. Yes. I actually, I used to do like 
literal post-it notes all over the wall yeah. but that w- I would just spend so much time just writing it down and like sticking it up and even though I loved being able to walk back and go on um Miro if anybody's like okay I need to redo my site map it's m i r o dot com it's a ux tool it's oh. totally free if it's just you and you can go on and do little digital post-it sticky notes this is awesome. When I'm on my discovery call with my clients, I can send them a link and we can work on it together at the same time. That's probably the best part about doing it digitally. That's really cool. Okay. I just pulled it up. Miro.com, M-I-R-O.com, uh, their brand position, speaking of, uh, where telecommunicate, actually they have a number of words playing here, but teams get work done, the online collaborative whiteboard platform to bring teams together anytime, anywhere. Okay. Very cool. Now with Show It, and by the way, sh- shout out to Todd Watson, who's a friend of mine, um, and has been on the the podcast a number of times. The CEO of Show It, incredible brand. Uh, I was just in their software recently, and it looked like the so called sitemap. And, and maybe Megan, there's a different way to look look at this. The sitemap on in their software, the web based software, is basically an outline over on the left hand side. Is that right? Um, yes, pretty much. I okay. know what you're saying. Okay, but for the visual, you're saying that you'll use Miro or maybe even get some actual sticky notes out and and kind of create this visual hierarchy and um, and navigation, if you will, for the websites that you're designing? Yeah. So for this site map, you should be able to see your entire site all at once. Okay. And you should be able to see the flow all at once. You should be able to take a step back. Um, while if you're going on show it, I know what you're saying, how it has like the page and then you can click on each individual canvas. Yes. That's a good idea of like transferring it over. But I think um, the ben- like the beneficial part of creating a really strategic site map is being able to give it a 360 view all at once. Okay. Okay, this is really good. Uh, all right, I'm going to keep going because I'm I'm already stoked about this information, and I'm I know it's going to be helpful to to listeners out there. So um, we've designed we've defined sitemap, um, and, and again, I love the the simplicity, the brevity, the hierarchy of pages, and it takes them on a journey. That's kind of a nice visual way to to think about it. You talked about the role of the sitemap um, a little bit as it relates to these um, these goals of showing work, showing experience, inviting to connect. What would you say, if you were to make a list, um, are the most important components of a a really strong sitemap? And and talk about the reasons for their significance, if you will. Okay. Most important of a strong sitemap are the very first impression. So you used the word above the fold earlier, and I was like, yes. Um, So you want to see your name, your logo, your location, the tagline. You want the summary of your business to be the first thing that they see. And then so... When going in and creating an actual, like a, the site map, when we're getting the sticky notes out, um, think about your different client segments. So photographers have more than one client segment or niche a lot of the times. So even if you are this like high end destination wedding photographer and you take 15 highly specialized weddings a year, maybe you're building an educational side and you're also trying to connect with other photographers. So with each of these different segments, there's a different action that um, you want them to take. So the sitemap is going to organize these segment journeys and create an experience. I can't say the word journey without thinking of The Bachelor. I don't know. You, I'm assuming you don't watch. If there's anyone else listening, bear with me. I know it's like a funny word. <laughs> hey, now. you can't you can't make assumptions here. No, I I haven't watched it recently. I certainly have in the past. So um, journey, you're you're thinking about journey as it relates to the show. Yeah. Um, okay. Just uh, bear with me when I use that word. I only use it ironically now, but sometimes with this. Anyway, carrying on. Um, Yeah, so you're creating an experience for each client segment where they're guided towards the information that they need to determine if you're the right fit for them and if they want to follow this journey. And during it, they want to be exposed to the perfect amount of information. They should be guided through enough information that they can determine if they want to take this action and if they should, but they shouldn't be overwhelmed. And you want to leave enough to the imagination where it's piquing their interest to connect with you. And then the other important part is, are there call to actions that guides your client segment from the homepage to an information page to take action and to keep engaging? You shouldn't be having dead ends on the bottom of your page. For example, on the bottom of your about page, you shouldn't just let it be your footer. You should guide them of, hey, check out these three blog posts that are about me. And these are my personal ones. You should keep them going and keep them interested and engaged on your website. So call to actions super important too. Yeah, I guess so that they don't. And and honestly, we've been guilty. I say we, like my company, our brand or brands have been guilty of, of I guess, at certain points, having dead ends on our websites. And, and I, in fact, I, I could stand to go back through our websites again, just to make sure that's not the case. 
Um, but it's it's important that when they land on your website, they're, you're not only sharing the information that you just highlighted, but you're also giving them calls to action so that they never get to the end of a page or a section without knowing what to do next or where to go next, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, that's that's super huge. All right, so I guess then the next question is what are... And, and, and of course, this is a much bigger conversation than the hour or so that we're going to spend here on the podcast today. And, and naturally, we'll once again share your website and information so that listeners can get in touch with you to get more dedicated help. But if, if photographers were to take a few steps today to improve the sitemap of their website, the navigational experience of their website for the ultimate goal of being able to convert clients more effectively, what would those steps be? Okay. One bust out a pen and paper, get ready to take some notes, pull up your website. And what you're going to do is you're going to evaluate your current sitemap as your different customers. So before you start this, you should know your different client audience segments. Who who are you trying to book? Um, what is the primary, secondary, secondary, and potentially tertiary? There's that word again. Yes, do it. To take. Um, so a wedding client, ideally, the first, the primary action you want them to take is to inquire and then second, you want them to engage with your business. So maybe you want to, um, them to follow you on Instagram and then tertiary, maybe you want them to keep looking through your blog. Um, and then so what information do you need to get them to take this action? So back to this wedding client, you want them to land on your page and you want to sort them and think about what is, I keep on going back to this critical information of what they need to know where they're confident enough to send an inquiry, but their interest is still peaked. And I think the minimum um, of this quote unquote critical information is what sets you apart. They need to see your work. They need to see the visual portfolio, um, a connection point. So I have something on my website that's like, you're an MPB ride if, and this is just another way to further connect with my clients. Um, personally, I am very big on personal branding. So that's why I want them to like know who I am. And then an idea on how much your clients invest. And then I also think you should throw in some sort of social proof, whether that's a testimonial or several testimonials, or if you've been published. Um, and then, so go in, go back to your website and then write down whether or not your clients or your audience segments are getting guided through this. And then another thing to look for, these are four things right now, one, is it easy to navigate? Is each segment able to easily find the information that they need in one place um, going along with this? I think that if you're doing like seniors, weddings, families, instead of having a portfolio page and a service page and an investment page, you should be able to go as like a potential family client and click on family, see the philosophy, see the work, see the investment just for that, because you shouldn't have to go to like three different pages to get all the information that you need to connect. Um, Second of all, does the website take the viewers on the journey you need? Are there call to actions? Um, it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a maze, but again, you want to minimize the dead end. At the end of your wedding page, you want to give your clients a bold call to action button to the contact page, or even just throw in a contact form and keep it going. Like once the inquiry is sent, you don't need to end the connection with them there. Maybe guide them on their success page. So after they submit the inquiry and you have the thank you for inquiring, I'll talk to you soon. Um, send them, invite them to follow you on Instagram or check out the blog, or even if you really want to go above and beyond embed a video talking to them or um, invite them to download a timeline guide or something like that. This could really reaffirm you as like an industry professional as if they click the inquiry and it's like, hi, here's a gift. It's going to make your life easier. And then you're just setting on a different level in their mind. That's something else. Third step, write down the improvements you want to make. These can be as easy as like adding a call to action at the end of your pages and making sure there are no dead ends. And then the last thing here we're going to want to do is if you find out, if you're going through the evaluation process and you're finding out that it's not doing what you want it to do, um, that was the off season for a lot of photographers and you can start from scratch. You don't have to be a professional. If you put in the research, you can totally do it yourself. Um, back to using Miro. I love using Miro as a UX tool to put this all down. It's free, it allows you to do everything easy or if you want, even hire a designer and go through it with them together. So just for today, to recap, I think I went off a little like tangent. Oh, it's great. <laughs> but get like prepare yourself for what you're looking for as far as audience segments and the actions you want them to take. Evaluate to make sure that they're getting enough information to take this. And then if not, write down what you need to fix and just go on and update your website that way. 
Yeah, well, you know, I, I know that you intentionally shared three points there, but I actually added another one based on what you were saying. So I had to evaluate sitemap based on target client and then establish goals. And I think this is an important one because, uh, and just really taking what you said, Megan, I mean, if if you know what your target client is or who your target client is and what it is you're trying to accomplish with that particular target client or market segment, then you can clearly establish goals which make it easier then for you to understand whether or not you've got the information necessary for those goals to be reached, again, to your point. Uh, And then based on this assessment, you can establish a flow that enables them to reach the information and ultimately the calls to action that convert them more effectively. This is, I love this. Um, and for those of you listening in to kind of, again, break the fourth wall, my, my biggest goal with, with the Boca podcast is to give you actionable information that you can apply to your business that is going to be helpful when it comes to time management, building your business, and yes, even becoming a better photographer. It doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily share, you know, PhD level earth shattering information that you've never heard before. The key is that it's action. It's easy to understand and actionable. And Megan, you've done a, a brilliant job really of summing up these ideas in a way that they are easy to understand, certainly actionable. And I, I think it's super powerful that our listeners now can take this information and go do something with it. I'm going to do something with it um, because you know, especially as you described the significance of a site map and what we're trying to achieve with our website, it would be very easy for me to go back and do a review. Now, the the adjustments, the tweaks, the improvements, then I can hire a designer. We have um, a team in-house, but then I can also go to someone like yourself to, to help us improve uh, that design. I think that's really important to note as well. But this has been really, really great information. I, I really appreciate you making time to share with us. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much for having me on again. I think this is a topic that gets overlooked when we're thinking we want to jump right to pretty design and all that stuff. And like you said, it's not rocket science. Nothing I said here was super, super earth shattering by any means, but it's all about awareness and being able to go in and diagnose yourself. Are we doing this right? And if not, like you, like people are so scrappy, you can totally figure out how to do this yourself. And then I, you're going to see the results and it's awesome. And I think that's why like having a strategy behind the website beyond just a pretty template or a pretty design is so crucial. Well, and, and I just want to be clear to you and, and to those listening in, uh, the idea that we're not going over PhD material is it's not a criticism. And, and in fact, it's actually a compliment to you and that you were able to share information in a simple, easy to understand way that's actionable. That's what's important because I, I know from personal experience, having been in the industry for 20 years, going to conferences, workshops, trade shows, and sitting in and listening to photographers, it's very easy to be like, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, that, that they're just repeating information that, you know, but it's another thing to then actually go do something with the information so we can roll our eyes uh, and then not go do anything. Or we can take the information, which in, in I think anyway, at least based on my personal experience, most of the things that are most effective in our business, principles, ideas, actionable information, aren't these overly complicated ideas. Sure, it may take some time to implement, but they're relatively simple principles and concepts. We just have to actually show up and do them and do them consistently for the sake of results. That's where it matters. So again, to reiterate, for everybody listening in, you may notice if you're a regular listener of the show, The concepts, the principles that we talk about, there is quite a bit of repetition. That is certainly intentional, um, especially when it comes to to, uh, time management. But the principles that we're sharing here aren't necessarily complicated or ones that maybe you've never heard before. I want to share these principles and these ideas so that you can go do something about them in your business, that you can ultimately grow your business, and then at the end of the day, still have a life as well. Um, and I think this has been a really well-rounded conversation in that regard, Megan. So again, thank you for that. Will you remind our listeners where they can find you online, your websites and your social media as well? Yeah. So I'd love to hang out with you guys. I'd love for you to connect. Um, you can find me on Instagram. I have that the baskin.co account. So I have educational resources. I have, of course, some designs that I'll be sharing. Um, you can also download a free pricing show it guide page. I made this 
around launch and I've gotten a lot of um, photographers loving using it. So if you want that, it's totally free. And then um, at Megan Baskin, M-E-G-H-A-N-B-I-S-K-I-N um, is my wedding photography Instagram. And I put a lot more personal stuff there. And I put way too much videos of me putting creamer into my coffee and watching it swirl. <laughs> That's my favorite thing in the world. Okay. Um, and then finally, if you are in the market to hire a custom designer, my website is baskinco.com and my next availability is on April 1st. So if you want to get started on that, you can book now for your slot in April. Wow. I love that. Okay. Well, and and um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm curious about this. This came to mind as you were, you were going to be talking about your social media accounts. Have you gotten on Clubhouse yet? I just got invited. I'm so honored. I'm so excited to get on Clubhouse. That's Are you? Okay. on my to-do list for this week. Yes. Okay. Well, maybe you can give us a report later later on at some point. I'm I just did an interview which um it, normally we we push out these interviews that I do in kind of chronological order in the order that I do them occasionally they get shuffled around. Uh by the time this episode comes out, I think my conversation with Devin Robinson about Clubhouse will have already come out. Um I'm still at, at I'm still kind of torn on the the platform, as those of you who have listened to that episode will now know, um, and and so I'm just kinda, I was kind of curious to get your take on it, Megan. I I hope you have a really great experience with it. You're able to gain a lot of value from it, and based on our conversation today, I hope that you're able to share some of your knowledge with those on the platform. I think it could be super helpful. Yeah, are you on Clubhouse? I am. Um, I haven't. Okay. So I've I've spent a little bit of time in rooms and. Thus far, I haven't done any kind of presentation or speaking or teaching or, or, or anything comparable uh, on the platform yet. One of the things that we've considered doing, and in fact, my, my daughter, uh, who's a sophomore in high school, designed uh, a, a little logo for this idea. We talked about doing little mini Boca podcast interviews on the platform, um, which, of course, has the added benefit as well of a, of a of time for a Q&A where we can actually have those that are listening in then ask questions to the guest. So do like a 10 or 15 minute interview. Um, call it Boca Bites uh, or Boca. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and and just do little mini interviews with again that added benefit or value of the Q and A, uh, and that's that may be something that I experiment with at some point. Uh, but I've been kind of I've been watching from afar, if you will, and kind of observing and, and getting others' take on the platform. So uh, once you get to experiment, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too. Um, and certainly, if if we develop uh, an active presence there on the platform, we'll share the details with everybody listening in in future episodes. But once again, thanks again, Megan, for hanging out with me today. This has been really, really nice. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at Boca podcast. Dot com. Make sure to visit our sponsors, photographersedit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.